In 2019, the International Classification of Diseases classified burnout an occupational phenomenon, leading the World Health Organization to embark on the development of evidence-based guidelines on mental well-being in the workplace. In addition to this, Anthony Klotz, a professor of business administration at Texas A&M University, who studies workplace resignations, coined the term the great resignation to describe the budding labor market that may force companies not only to raise wages and increase benefits, but to also offer more flexibility to attract and retain an in-person workforce. Welcome to the fireside chat on this occupational phenomenon of Bernhard that has companies revising change management and how they adopt the rapid change and agency that employees have employed, exacerbated, of course, by the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Vuelwe Tutubese and a privilege it is to be having this courageous conversation of the workplace, a fireside chat investigating what you can do to help your team feel better equipped to deal with challenging times while also boosting your own energy and well-being so that you can fully take care of your team and your business. I am joined by Sabina Nawaz, a global CEO coach, a leadership keynote speaker and writer on Burnout at Work, a Courageous Conversation. Sabina is a global CEO coach, a leadership keynote speaker and writer in over 26 countries. She advises C-level executives in Fortune 500 companies, as well as uh, government agencies, nonprofits, and academic institutions. She also teaches a faculty at the Northeastern University and facilitates a faculty fellowship development program at Drexel University. Sabina, a very warm welcome to this very much needed fireside chat, especially at such a, a big scale uh, and regional future of HR uh, virtual summit and a pleasure to have you uh, in this conversation because this is a conversation where we're talking about this new world of work, this present future of work. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us and I want us to waste no time in getting uh, into the work. What exactly constitutes as burnout? And, and, and you know, when we're talking about exhaustion and burnout, um, this is something that some have termed to be quite common in contemporary society. Uh, but I'd like to think that this has been something uh, that has existed for years without a name uh, uh, and, if you will, an anonymous, effective, productive, productivity kryptonite, uh, if you will. Thank you so much, Boyolua, too. It is a pleasure to be here. And this topic couldn't be more timely in the face of the great resignation, in the face of so many things that we're facing. Your question about what constitutes burnout, and I think I think your hunch is exactly right, and that's my hunch as well, that burnout has been around for as long or perhaps longer than we discovered fire. Because if you think of the word burnout, it means the fire is burning out. This, we cannot stoke it any longer. We cannot energize it anymore. The embers are just start, starting to fizzle out and die. And as I was thinking about this conversation with you today that I'm so excited about because it's just the right time, I recognized how many times we use fire-based terms in our vocabulary. So we are having a fireside chat. We <laughs> talk about employees who are burning with passion. We talk about people who are on fire. We're lighting things ablaze with our trails that we're sparking. We're sparking up ideas. So think about how much energy goes into producing in this knowledge worker world that we're talking about right now. And when there's so much energy on the fire, how much energy are we placing on tending to that fire? And what happens when there's nothing left to burn? Because burning also causes pollution. And are we paying attention to that pollution? 
So to me, burnout happens when that fire is starting to get extinguished and all we're left with is the smog and the smoke and the pollution from it. Now, in human terms, of course, the telltale signs, we have all faced that at some point or the other, especially over the last couple of years. It's that exhaustion and fatigue physically, but also emotionally and mentally, where we start to feel cynical or hopeless or anxious, or worst of all, in some ways, a flat line. Our affect just goes, oh gosh, it's the same old, same old, one more day. I just don't know how to pull myself up out of my bootstraps. It sucks the joy out of our daily existence. And, and I love the analogy of, of fire and indeed with this fireside chat uh, that we're even having. Um, but I am curious, you know, because even in this conversation, uh, it, it is in this corporate setting, right? It is in this uh, uh, where the, the, the suits and ties still are and we're having uh, and using this business jargon uh, to, to employ. How do we translate um, this analogy of fire. How do we translate uh, these feelings that that are emotional, right? Um, which are and have been proven uh, to be a kryptonite to how we work and to 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 affect the return on investment, the positive return on investment uh, to to um, to the company. So how do we translate uh, that language? into the workplace or that language into um, the HR professionals, the business leaders, uh, the innovators who are tuning in uh, that can justify uh, and, and claim it to be evidence enough uh, so that we can actually take the time and, and to your point, keep that fire burning and tender to it. Absolutely. Great question for you, Luat, too, because ever since the pandemic, started the I've been running a regular forum with a small group of heads of HR CHROs and the majority of the conversation is around burnout but here's the funny thing that's happened as we've had this conversation now for nearly two years is we're also recognizing the burnout that HR professionals are facing because in many ways they're the first responders they have to tend to the fires that have been lit up in fighting this. And they've been in firefighting mode for far too long and they are getting exhausted and drained and enervated. So yes, it is an imperative across HR and across organizations to recognize this. And that I think is the first step is recognition. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, especially, I saw way too many executives who were having the good news is they were having town halls. They were talking to employees. The bad news is a lot of times in my mind, it was the language of denial. It was the language of denial. This was the language you could say they were saying they would say it was the language of hope. But to me, it was the language of denial. The language sounded like this. We will get through this. It'll be done in no time. We are resilient. And when we say we are resilient, when somebody is really struggling to get out of bed or somebody whose work conditions now from home are untenable, we've seen the rise in domestic violence. We've seen people who have to take care of the, as the sandwich generation, take care of everybody at home and somehow appear professional on a video. So talking about resilience, and we are resilience in a way leads to a denial of the human condition or CEOs who say we're all in the same boat. You know what? We're not in the same boat. We are in the same storm, but we all have different boats. Some of us have luxury liners and yachts. And some of us have little dinghies where we have to bail out the water. So I think from a corporate perspective, the first thing, and we're seeing that more now in the face of the great resignation, is recognizing that we have a branch of that pandemic that is the cost, the mental cost, the psychic cost of us producing work and being productive when there is this powerful kryptonite. And I love your term kryptonite 
because when we when you look up kryptonite it talks about how in the short term it does not impact human beings but in the long term it's fatal of course we know kryptonite is fake but i think we like to think burnout and all of this is also fake it's out there it happens to somebody else we, right so we we know what it looks like once we get it once we are facing it but do we know what it looks like the absence of burnout what does it look like to have balance to have that calm so i think the first step is recognizing it the second step is giving it enough space enough space to actually for people to recover, for them to have more agency. I love that word that you used, Voluatu, uh, is, is around um, that space, giving that that space to, to heal, to recover, to grieve, to recognize that uh, perhaps we're not ever going back to that normal that we've been holding up, uh, that some form of this life might be our life for the foreseeable future and then to figure out how we can also be productive because let's face it of course we need productivity of course we need businesses to thrive and for us to have a livelihood that that matches that um, thrival yeah yeah, absolutely. And and I love how you you encourage, you know, us to really uh, be present and honor the moment in which we're feeling deprived, in which we're feeling depleted um, and create the opportunity to say that even though, you know, we are living in these um, these these unprecedented times, I think, has been the term for, for, for the past few years, uh, for the past two years, rather. Um, but it is important that that we recognize that there is uh, the opportunity for hope, um, but we need to be active in taking these strategies um, and, and in being proactive in, in understanding and being fully aware of, you know, where we are. Um, but, but I also think in order for employees to feel this way, it's up to leadership it is up to leadership to really take on this baton um and 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 recognize that there needs to be strategies in place we cannot just uh strategize on hope and strategize on faith uh, and something that i love uh, in what you say is that you you really believe in that uh one of the greatest privileges of doing the work that you're doing is that you get to bear witness to the acts of courage uh, of such conversations and of such actions uh, and and the courage that it take uh to to really respond to the vulnerabilities of your employees what does it take to do so and i think especially as it seems that we are facing uh, a, a roadblock where where leaders and managers are not properly trained to deal with such occurrences uh, of the burnout of the organizations because to your point it, it sometimes it all has always been to uh, the work of human resources um but now we're finding that we're, we're at some point there is uh, this level leveling playing field uh, that the remote work has brought forth to the table. Yes, absolutely. It's and I would say the first step is to tend to yourself and to model that, to really actually share what's actually going on for you. And to me, bringing back that old fire analogy, it's sitting around the fire and sharing stories. It is incredibly powerful when an executive at a senior level says, you know what? I had a hard time getting out of bed today. And yet I did get out of bed. And by the end of the day, this is what I found. So it's not saying it has to be devoid of hope and it has to be all about this crushing pain. I think you can have the two side by side. So really, really telling the story. And I've been working with many of the CEOs I coach in how to show a little bit of the pain, a little bit of the grief that they themselves are facing. Because you know what? What do their people say when they don't see that? When they just see, we will march on, we will, we will overcome this, is they go, well, does this person have a heart? Are they not mourning all the people who have left because of the great resignation? So I think one is really telling your own story, sharing your struggles, 
vulnerably, it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. I think there's a second piece. Side by side with the great resignation is what I would call the great collusion. The great collusion. And this is what the great collusion looks like. We at the corporate level might say, of course we want you to invest in your well-being. Of course we want you to seek work-life balance. Do what you need to do to take care of it. Maybe for four hours on a Sunday. <laughs> because secretly, aren't we happy when people say, oh, I work so hard, I work through the, through the night. On the one hand, we say, take care of yourself. I'm worried about your burnout. But on the other hand, we're saying, keep it going, fuel it more, fuel it more. So there is this collusion that happens between the employer and the employee where we actually reward. Hard work, not smart work. And for the employees. It becomes an addiction. It's what gets rewarded, so it's almost Pavlovian. Well, if I don't, if I'm not showing up on email when they are all showing up on email, if I'm not doing this right away, I've got to what have I done for them lately? And this last week, Volu, vo, Voluatu, I am determined here. Uh, <laughs> this last week, we, we, I ran a workshop on work-life balance. And what's beautiful is people started sharing really vulnerably what was going on for them. And one of the participants said her goal, her goal right now to seek balance was to get a B at work. And she said that's incredibly hard for me. I am an overachiever. I like to get an A. I like to please people. I like to be seen and recognized but I'm going to work on getting a B at work so that I can get an A in life. Because that B at work is going to get you back another day. And right now, is this the right time? Well, and maybe we change the definition of what A at work looks like. Because of course, research shows that by her chasing the B, she is actually more likely to produce A quality work when she's had more food, more nurturing, more sleep. She is actually going to be more productive. We have this myth with the great, great, great collusion that just working more hours is going to create that A. But actually, what if we all try to get a B at work and an A in life? And magically, that's going to produce the A at work. And 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 I love this um, this analogy again, or, or this term of the great collusion, because I think somewhere in between the great resignation and the great coll collusion, there are these strategies, there are these programs uh, that we definitely uh, can implement, and and to to some extent, you know, um, appease both the employer and the the employee. Uh, and and in your book, and I really want to bring in um, the 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 courageous conversations uh, that you employ employ us to have. Uh, what are these types of strategies or programs uh, that you encourage an organisation uh, to have in place uh, to really adequately assist employees who are experiencing burnout? Yes, so of course there's employee assistance programs and and really making sure we're doubling down on that. Uh, there there are there there is also a way to think creatively about various ways and a lot of organizations are looking at creative ways to give people time off. Um, I have one individual who has declared for his organization it's okay to take two hour vacations. Now, you know, the reality is nobody's really counting, especially when you're working from home, you can do what you want in many ways. But by giving permission to say, let's chunk it down. Let's give you small, don't just hoard. Don't just wait. I, at this time of year, so many people are saying, I cannot wait to get to the December holidays where I take time off, which many of us get. Well, that's not enough because right now, your work is not very, it's lackluster. So what if you took a two hour vacation every week? This guy takes two hours off every Thursday. He gardens outside, brings back flowers for his partner, uh, 
whatever he it takes a walk smells the fresh air. So and a lot of employers are looking at meeting free Fridays or uh, a day off every uh, once a month. Now they're very complicated issues, of course, we because you've got hourly pay, you've got uh, non hourly pay, you've got many, many logistical hurdles to cross. But are there ways to give people some relief? Is there a way also to look at reprioritizing things? If you uh, read uh, Essentialism by Greg McKeown, he talks about the origin of the word priority, that it never had a plural in its original form. Priority meant a singular thing. Is there a way for organizations to get clearer about their vision, about their priorities, that is focusing on the thing that's most important? What is that piece of wood that's going to keep that fire burning versus all the little stuff you're putting in there that's not going to last very long? And what I hear over and over again is, yes, oh yes, we have priorities, but then we never say no to anything else. So I think getting clear on priorities, doubling down on employee assistant programs, thinking more creatively about ways to ease up time that we're expecting from people. Uh, one of the, in the CHRO forum I run, I thought one of the creative ideas that an organization is doing is they have a regular forum with a trained psychologist. And uh, this is on Zoom and people show up to this anonymously, they enter their questions, and then the psychologist speaks to those issues. Wow. You know, that's a that's a great way to help people normalize first that what I'm feeling, I'm not some freak of nature, right? And I don't have to hide in shame about it. Actually, if I give it some sunlight, it allows other people to bring in their issues. And the only way out of it is through it. So let's discuss it. Let's let's experience it. Let's honor it and then figure out how to move past it. So I thought that that was a great idea. Mm, mm, it absolutely is. And I think this is why this is called a courageous conversation, because it, at the end of the day, it really goes down to the individual. Right. And I think being convicted uh, about your emotions and I think being aware of the impact that they have in not only your work, uh, but I think throughout your 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 daily life and how you are able to to execute and even wake up and keep that fire burning that will last beyond the nine to five or even before um, the nine to five occurs. And as we wrap up uh, this fireside chat, I, I want to bring it to the individual, right? And and I love uh, this 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 trade that you brought up around priority you know uh, because it starts with one step or it starts with one uh, seed of, of a mind shift that could take place what is your message as as we wrap up this discussion on how we can think about um, prioritizing our well-being prioritizing uh, tending to our fire because the reality is that you know we won't get it right but what I also don't want us to do is wait until December uh, for us to really feel and to take in uh, the work that we've done and to pat ourselves on the back and say I have survived year two of the pandemic uh, but also I have survived uh, the financial year and so Voyaluatu, are you saying one priority that individuals can take? Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. And I would say so. There are many common ones that uh, even I've written about in in my writing around gratitude and disconnecting from devices and connecting with human beings, setting boundaries. So I'll pick something very different. If there's one thing you do when you're feeling burned out, when you're feeling apathetic, when you're feeling low energy, when you're feeling skeptical. Find another person to help. Find another person, not whom you're seeking help from, but to whom you're giving help. Because when we reach out outside of ourselves and help someone else, several things happen. One, we get a sense of accomplishment. Two, it puts our own challenges in perspective because there's always someone else out there who's worse off. Three, it actually helps somebody else in the process. 
and it, it lights a positive fire, a movement that shifts our own energy and brings something else out into the universe. And and what I love about this 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 final and very poignant point that you bring out is that it also gives us the opportunity to receive and opening ourselves to receive. Yes. And I absolutely love that. And I think what a brilliant way to, to wrap up this conversation. And uh, we'll put out a fire into this fireside chat, but hopefully uh, we have energized and given you uh, quite a few things to think about uh, as you navigate uh, your way, as you navigate your well-being uh, in the workplace. That was uh, Sabina Nawaz, a global CEO, coach, a leadership keynote speaker, and a writer on Burnout at Work, a Courageous Conversation.